According to Sean's grandmother, there are two things that are certain in life, death and taxes. Well, today we are going to be talking about the first of those things because I read a fascinating book on the subject. We're going to be discussing the practicalities of cremation versus burying, how the Civil War transformed the death industrial complex, and also some of the coolest cemeteries in the United States. I'm sure you're dying to hear about it. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. Friends, welcome to Timeless, the show where I talk about timeless, eternal subjects. You can see because of the introduction why I am not a comedian. Instead, I am a, I guess, sort of comedian, talk show host. Sean told me in my ear during the music, I hate how much I loved that. Well, thank you, Sean, and thank you to your grandmother for that nugget of information. It really is true, the two uh, things in certain life are death and taxes. You know, I know I've been joshing around with you for the first few moments of this show, but in all seriousness, death is something that I think that all of us should contemplate more often, especially at my age, I'm 23 years old. We sort of have the idea that we're going to live forever. And that's not necessarily a knock on young people. I think everyone when they're young doesn't think about their deaths and that's a healthy thing. You don't want to obsess about it unnecessarily or too much. But I think if you think more about your death, as corny as it sounds, you have more of an appreciation for life. And it sort of guides you in thinking, well, how do I want to live my life? How do I want to use this opportunity? And I think one of the greatest uh, sort of things that comes out of thinking about your death more is that you don't care about what other people think. When I first went on Dennis Prager's show back when I was a sophomore in college and I spoke publicly about my conservatism and then I decided to kind of embark on this radio talk show hosting career where I was going to be very open about my conservative beliefs, of course there were times when I thought about, oh my gosh, what are other people going to think about me? What are my classmates going to think? What are people in my neighborhood going to think? What are my old teachers and peers going to think about me? And then, as weird as it sounds, I honestly thought about my death. And I thought, am I going to be on my deathbed and think about what those people thought about me? No, I'm going to look back and hope, hope that I lived my life well. Those people don't matter because honestly, we all die anyway. So screw the people that are giving you a hard time. Live the life that you want to live. So what inspired this segment, of course, is that I've been contemplating the fact that we need to think more about death, but also I have to give credit. I read this really cool book called Over My Dead Body. It's right here on the set by Greg. Oh, you put up a picture, fancy. Uh, by Greg Melville, who is a veteran who served in Afghanistan. And I guess he had a particular fascination with cemeteries. And I highly recommend this book to anyone who's just looking for a cool subject to read about because you know the thesis statement of this show. Uh, I mean, I should say part of the thesis statement is that there are timeless eternal values that we all should uh, aspire to embrace. But also life is cool. The fact that life is cool is also a timeless eternal uh, thing. So if you just want to read about a cool subject in life, which I'm going to be talking about today, make sure to read this book. If you put all of America's cemeteries together, they would be the larger acreage than the state of Delaware. That's how many cemeteries we have. Central Park, Madison Square Park, Chicago's Lincoln Park, most of the parks in and around your neighborhood, whether or not they're big and famous, are actually more likely than not built on top of cemeteries or resting places. Also, the death industrial complex in the United States has an annual sales revenue of $20 billion. As comparison, the sneaker industrial complex or the amount of annual sales that sne the sneaker industry has in the US is $16 billion. So whether we wanna think about it or not, death is all around us and it is a big part of American society. One of the things that Greg Melville said in the introduction of this book is that gravestones provide the first and last pages of your story, the story of your life. And that is certainly true, but of course it leaves so much out about an individual. 
But cemeteries, on the other hand, can tell you so much about the history of your country and, of course, the history of the site itself. For instance, in the American West, in various towns in California, Nevada, Arizona, etc., it is not uncommon to stumble across sort of scattered cemeteries that have uh, primarily Chinese people as the deceased in that cemetery. And this dates back to our history in the United States at the end of the 19th century, when many people from China came over to the west coast of the United States during the gold rush of the 1850s to seek economic opportunities. And for that second half of the 19th century, Chinese Americans were instrumental in building the transcontinental railroad that connected the east side of our nation to the west side. It, before the Transcontinental Railroad, it took six months to, to traverse across the United States. The railroad changed that to four days. That's one example of how cemeteries can reveal a lot about history. Another example is that a lot of antebellum cemeteries in the South are segregated according to race. A third example pertains to cemeteries that aren't even in the United States. The U.S. government has commissioned and indeed bought land in places outside of our national territory in order to bury soldiers who fought in overseas wars. One of the greatest examples of that is our actual national cemetery that is in France near the uh, beach in Normandy where the World War II fighters landed. And interestingly, that particular cemetery became sort of a cultural flashpoint during the Cold War. The U.S. government made sure that each of the gravestones in that cemetery were of Christian crosses. And that was a way to sort of assert Western civilizational imagery in that land because during the time of the early Cold War, France's Communist Party actually exercised a lot of influence. So it was sort of a battleground between Western slash American and Eastern slash Soviet ideas. So it just shows you how cemeteries can be politicized and they can also reveal so much about history. Speaking of history, the Civil War transformed death in America. The, the practices of funerals and also the practices of how to take care of bodies. During the Civil War, 620,000 Americans, both on the side of the Union and the side of the Confederacy, died. That was 2% of the U.S. population, which is just astounding. That's 10 times as many deaths as during the entirety of the Vietnam War. And so there were many American soldiers who were dying on the battlefield. I mean, these ba individual battles had thousands of Americans in a single battle die, and they just didn't have the time or the resources to gather up the bodies and be able to transport them back to their families. So there was this big problem in the United States where these bodies would either be left on the battlefield or they would be deposited in mass grave sites. So the Lincoln administration and under other members of the U.S. government had to contemplate how to fix this. So what they did is they started the practice of buying land for national cemeteries, the most famous of which is the Gettysburg National Cemetery. I guess the most famous nowadays is Arlington, but back then it was the Gettysburg National Cemetery in Pennsylvania, and that is the site where President Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address in 1863. Now the practice of funerals prior to the Civil War is very important here in understanding how Lincoln transformed the practice. Prior to the Civil, Civil War, funeral practices were done in a very localized, familial way. What happened was there were certain rites that had to be, religious rites that had to be performed over a body once that individual died. And it was very customary to have the body be displayed in what was called a death room at the family's home in their living room, what we now call a living room, but back then was called a death room. And by the way, the reason why we call it a living room now is because it, was, it is no longer a death room with the advent of so many cemeteries. So what happened was they would do the rites over the body, they would put the body in the death room in the family's home so fam family and friends could come and pay respects to the body. And then the family would transport, oftentimes literally physically carry the coffin 
to a nearby um, church that they belong to in order to bury the body. And there was this idea of having a good death in America that was very, again, familialized and localized. And with the Civil War and with the Lincoln administration's advent of national cemeteries, this changed because, again, it had to change. Over half a million people died in the war and they needed to do something with those bodies. So what Greg Melville argues is that the advent of national cemeteries sort of divorced us from this family uh, ritual of dealing with death. And this sort of opened the floodgates of the what Mel Melville calls the funeral industrial complex in the United States. We know the Gettysburg Address that Lincoln gave at the Gettysburg National Cemetery as advocating for the end of slavery. However, there is also a really important line in it in which Lincoln says, we cannot consecrate, we consecrate, excuse me, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have hallowed it far above our power to add or detract. That sentence, or I suppose those two sentences, gave the idea that you didn't have to do the family rituals in order for that individual to have a proper death. The sacrifice of the individual, the way that the individual lived his or her life is enough. There doesn't need to be all of this, again, family or proper mourning um, traditional guidelines surrounding one's death. So that's the first way that the Civil War sort of transformed death. Another way is actually the process of embalming came about during the Civil War. For those who are unaware, embalming is where uh, funeral directors or morticians put embalming fluid, which are a bunch of chemicals, into a body in order to preserve that body so that uh, family members can, can look at it during a wake. Otherwise, the body starts to rapidly decompensate also, sorry for TMI, but it's just true, the body starts to smell within about a day of the individual dying. And there's another thing that embalming prevents, and that is called rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is this phenomenon where in about two to three hours of one's death, their body sort of becomes locked in the position that they died in. Their, their uh, bones, again, sort of become locked or rigid. And so they will sort of permanently be, be in that position that they died in. But embalming fluid uh, allows for that not to happen so that the body can, can lie flat and be able to be looked at. What was that, Sean? He said something in my ear. Bones are always rigid, the, mu the, um, the muscle stiffen. Thank you. This is, again, you know why I'm not a comedian and you know why I'm not a biologist. So embalming came about, again, during the Civil War. I just explained what embalming is. And it happened because of a particular death of a Union fighter. His name was Colonel Elmer Ellsworth. He's actually considered to be the first death of the Civil War. He fought on the side of the Union, and he was very close to President Lincoln. He actually served as a law clerk at President Lincoln's law firm. And there's this whole sort of mythological tale around him, which we don't know if it's, it's true or not, but apparently he climbed a building to take down a Confederate flag in Washington, D.C., because from the White House, they could see the Confederate flag flying on that building. And as he was taking down the flag, he was shot and killed. But he was considered to be the first uh, death in the Civil War. And so what they did, and it sounds sort of improper, but it sounds sort of like a propaganda opportunity, but they really wanted to display his body to sort of make him into a martyr or a figure in order to rally support for the Union. And so what happened was after he died, there was this obscure man named Thomas Holmes who was experimenting with embalming. And President Lincoln hired him to experiment with embalming on this Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, the first guy who died in the Civil War, in order to see if they might be able to preserve his body so that he could do a East Coast mourning tour and everyday Americans could view his body and again be reminded of the Civil War that they were founding. Turns out that this guy who was experimenting with embalming was successful. So he was able to successfully embalm this Union soldier's body. And this Union soldier was transported all throughout the East Coast of the United States. In one day in New York City, 10,000 Americans viewed his body. And they put up banners that said, Elmer's blood cries for vengeance. There were songs written about him. 
So this figure that became such a sort of mythological figure during the Civil War became that mythological figure because of the process of embalming that allowed his body to be seen. So from there, embalming just took off because it allowed the body to be preserved and get, gave family members a certain number of days. If they were, you know, 10 days or three days away from traveling to the funeral, they could preserve the body until that family member got there and could see the body for the last time and pay respects. Jews and Muslims, by the way, interestingly, forbid embalming. Of course, some Jews and Muslims still participate in it, but according to those two religious traditions, you are not supposed to embalm. Uh, finally, caskets changed in the aftermath of the Civil War, and this is because of this sort of growing, what Greg Melville calls, funeral or death industrial complex. They, all these cemeteries opened, the process of embalming became more common. And another thing that transformed were the physical uh, boxes that the bodies were held in. They used to be coffins, which now we think of as in horror movies. The sort of wooden, narrow boxes that are wide at the shoulders and look really creepy. What happened was after the Civil War, coffins became replaced by caskets. Caskets are much more uh, pleasant to look at. They look like more of a sort of pleasant place for the body to lie in. They're lined with silk or velvet. They have a hinged lid. And caskets were actually modeled after jewelry boxes to resemble jewelry boxes and make it seem like the, the person who was being held in it had a more comfortable death than just in a wooden coffin. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about cremation versus burying. There's a fascinating practical and sort of religious history surrounding these practices. So why are people buried? Why have people traditionally in the United States been buried? Well, it allows you to have a tie to the person, a place to go and visit. You know that their body is there and it sort of allows um, you to go and, and pay respects to a specific site where that person is resting. Also, on the flip side, having someone be buried as, a pro as opposed to cremated allows for a bit of separation between you and the dead. This is not said with any judgment ab about people who, who cremate uh, or who hold a loved one's ashes in their home, but some may argue that it is difficult to sort of move on from the death or mo move on with your life if that person's urn is there right in front of you every single day in your living room. Having someone be buried away from you gives you a place to visit them and pay respect to them, but also allows you to continue with your life without the daily reminder that they are gone. But of course, burying really came about due to religious reasons. According to the Judeo-Christian tradition, a body is seen as a sacred vessel belonging to God and it should be placed in the ground so that when the Messiah comes for the Jews the first time for Christians the second time then bodies too can be resurrected in the ground to join the Messiah during the Roman Empire you may remember that the Roman Empire was responsible for killing Jesus and then about 300 years after Jesus's death the Romans converted to Christianity the Roman Empire started off cremating people, and then when they converted to Christianity, they banned cremation and indeed passed a law that said anyone who performed cremation would be put to death because it is viewed as a rejection of Christ or a rejection of God. This is not true in other countries. Actually, the West is sort of unique in its burial practices. In the East, it's the very inverse. It is very, very common to cremate people. It's actually seen as more ritually pure. For instance, in India, there are many Hindu funeral pyre burnings where a body is cremated. Additionally, uh, in Japan, cremation is the, is the norm. 99.8% of all bodies, dead bodies in Japan, are cremated, which is pretty stunning. But issues with burying in the West arose during the uh, modern period, actually in large part because of disease. There were various plagues that afflicted Europe during the 19th century. And what happened was in Germany in the 1860s and in France in the 1870s, there were a lot of cases of people having typhoid fever. 
And the highest or the, the population that had the most of these cases were the ones that lived near cemeteries and drank water from wells that were located near cemeteries. So that is sort of how the West started to transition away from burials and towards cremation, really for the sake of eliminating disease. Also, of course, there is the practical space issue. You can't fit bodies, uh, you know, there's only a finite amount of space that you can fit full bodies in a casket, whereas if you cremate someone and bury them, it's a fraction of the size of the space. Arlington National Cemetery, which is in Virginia, I'm going to talk about it in just a moment, has 85,000 spots left for coffins or caskets in its land. That seems like a lot to us, but it's not. Over the past 60 years, 22 million Americans have served for this country. And so it's sort of, uh, Arlington is in this weird situation where they are considering having to discriminate against certain uh, service people in order to be able to figure out who should be buried there. They're considering whether or not just to have people buried there who got Purple Hearts or who died in a certain battle, which sort of unravels the whole very idea that service people are equal and equal, of course, in death. So, and, and, and also another fa fascinating fact, San Francisco in the early 1900s said that they just did not have any more space to bury bodies. Also, they wanted to clear out some of the space that cemeteries were taking up in order to allow developers to come in and build shopping malls and buildings. So in the early 1900s, they ordered the removal of thousands of graves. Literally, they hired people and paid people to dig up bodies and transport them to a nearby suburb. So now in the United States, cremation, it used to be uh, only the minority of dead bodies that were cremated. Now it is the, the norm, a lot in large part due to these reasons. In 1960, 3% of all dead American bodies were cremated. As of 2020, that number is 56%. And it is estimated by 2030, it will be 75 percent. And even religious organizations or authorities have sort of acknowledged that there are these practical issues and have, have transitioned away from the orthodoxy of only allowing burials. In 1963, the Vatican lifted the thousand-year-old cremation ban. They said as long as there was a full body in a church, in a casket, in a Catholic funeral, you could cremate the body after. Then in the 1990s, they revised that to say the cremation could take place before a funeral. And then in 2016, they clarified by saying that cremated remains had to be buried in a cemetery. They couldn't be on display in a home or they couldn't be scattered at a various site. But now the practice of cremation, though practically sort of more advantageous, also financially more advantageous because when you bury a body, you have to buy the casket, you have to buy the plot of land, you have to buy, buy the gravestone, it's very costly. Cremation is not as costly. But now cremation is coming under attack, mainly by the political left for environmental reasons. One cremation emits 550 pounds of carbon dioxide. That is the equivalent of driving a gas-powered vehicle 700 miles. In India, where I said there's the practice of Hindu funeral pyre cremations, they have to cut down between 50 and 60 million trees annually in order to do that job. So there's a real, just when you think you've solved one practical problem, another practical problem arises. And it's just really interesting to contemplate for people who are running a society, how to best do it. Because on the one hand, you have these practical concerns, disease, space of burying bodies, uh, environmental concerns of cremation, but you also have to balance those with cultural concerns. Because the way that you treat a dead body says a lot about how you treat the living. So you have to account for practicality, practicality, but there also needs to be an element of ritual and respect to a dead body in order to keep a society healthy. So on to our final part of the episode today. I'm going to talk to you about three cemeteries that this guy, my friend Greg Melville, highlighted in this book. And they're three very different cemeteries, but they're so cool with what they reveal. The first one is the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Massachusetts. This was actually the playground, if you will, for literary figures such as Louisa May Alcott, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry David Thoreau, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. 
all four of those individuals are buried there. And they came together at the end of the 19th century and actually established this place where they, which was a park where they wrote a lot of their books slash essays. They came together and decided to make it a cemetery so that A, they could be buried there and B, to preserve the land. During that time, Concord, Massachusetts, which is where the cemetery is located, was becoming heavily gentrified, heavily industrialized. And so these literary titans put their heads together and they said, how do we preserve this? We make it a cemetery so that people can't touch it. And that's exactly what they did. And so we think of the first conservation project ever in the United States as being Yellowstone National Park, which was established by the United States Congress as the first national park in 1872. But actually, the first, the nation's first protected space in its history was not Yellowstone. It was this Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, which our most famous author, authors established themselves. So Emerson and Thoreau, you may recognize those names. They are the leaders of the transcendentalist movement. That was a literary and philosophical movement that occurred at the end of the 19th century, which essentially said it wasn't pagan, interestingly. Pagan is sort of the worship of nature. It wasn't pagan. It affirmed Judeo-Christian values. But it said that nature was a conduit to God, that nature could reveal certain moral truths. This was a backlash to the Industrial Revolution in the United States that was moving away from nature, gentrifying parks. And so Emerson wrote the book, Nature, and Thoreau wrote, of course, Walden. And in it, they argued that man needs to be in nature in order to have his soul fulfilled, in order to feel closer to God. There's this great line in Emerson's Nature. He writes, every moment instructs and every object for wisdom is infused into every form. That is sort of a teleological argument about how nature sort of has moral or life lessons to teach you. One of the examples is that uniquely, only one male and one female can make a child. Many people, such as Emerson and Thoreau, argue that that's sort of God's hand of moral instruction, trying to urge you to have a heterosexual relationship and also to urge uh, human beings away from polygamy. So in other words, nature sort of outlines for you what the moral or societal I ideal is. That's sort of the basis of the transcendentalist movement. And so all of those authors are buried in that cemetery. Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, Thoreau, Emerson, and Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Women about her experience being in that park, which is now a cemetery. And Apropos of my earlier conversation about how we need to contemplate death more, Emerson and Thoreau really thought that too. And one of the things that they stressed is that they did not want that cemetery to be perfectly curated. We see a lot of cemeteries, like the grass is cut perfectly. It sort of looks like a country club. Emerson and Thoreau said, we want the nature of the cemetery to be sort of overcrowding, like the roots of the trees are coming up against the tombstones and the grass is uneven because they wanted to remind people that cemeteries are sort of the ultimate encapsulation of the human human form, that humans rejoin their bodies with nature, and then this cycle kind of continues. During the dedication of the cemetery, Emerson said, the acorns falling at our feet will be oaks overshadowing our children in a remote century. By the way, some of you have been asking what this book is behind me. Can they see it from, uh, oh good, they can see it. In case you didn't, you can't tell by the title, it is The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I will do an episode telling you why I think The Scarlet Letter is the most important book of our, of our time and why everyone should read it. But Nathaniel Hawthorne, who was one of the people buried in this cemetery, got his inspiration uh, for a very famous scene between Hester Prynne and Arthur Dimsdale that is in this book. He got that inspiration from being in this park, which was converted into a cemetery, which is where he is buried. I think that's cool. Maybe you don't, but I'm a huge Nathaniel Hawthorne fan. Okay, on to the second cemetery, Arlington National Cemetery. I told you about Lincoln during the Civil War commissioning or buying the land for national cemeteries. This happened in Arlington too. 
400,000 service people are buried there. 25 burials happen a day. I told you they only have 85,000 spots left, which is not a lot. The story of Arlington is riveting. You will not believe how historically important it is. Arlington was actually the home of the Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Guess who the Confederate General Robert E. Lee was married to? This is crazy. He was married to the great granddaughter of George Washington, and they had a son together named George Washington Curtis Lee. Mind blown. Anyway, he and his wife, the great granddaughter of George Washington, lived on uh, the grounds of what is now Arlington National Cemetery. When he went to go fight in the Civil War to be the leader of the Confederate Army, the Union occupied that land, kicked out the wife, the great granddaughter of Washington, and built actually a town on the premises called the Freedman's Village to house runaway slaves, give them a place to live, give them a place to get an education, etc. And then they started burying bodies on the premises, A, because there was a need to, as I said, there were so many bodies, they didn't know what to do with them, they had to give them a proper burial, so they started burying them on the, on the Arlington grounds because there was space, and B, because they wanted to ensure that the Lees could never live there again. So if God forbid, you know, Robert E. Lee came back and wanted to live in that place, they would say, sorry, it's now a cemetery. You can't live in your house. But now it is the, the National Cemetery of the United States. They built this really amazing memorial amphitheater where presidents, as you can see in this picture, give remarks. And this was designed to mimic sort of the architecture of Greek and Roman times, asserting the importance of Western civilization in this place where where people are buried for, for fighting wars on behalf of Western civilization, the, the imagery is very important. Now, our former president, JFK, I believe he is the only, or maybe there's another president that's buried there. I think he is one of the only presidents that is buried at Arlington. His brother, RFK, is also buried there. His other brother, Ted Kennedy, is buried there. And his wife, Jackie O, is buried next to him. And during the 1960s, after JFK's assassination in 1963, the Kennedy family gave a lot of money and really pushed to have JFK be buried there. And they created this imagery of the eternal flame, which is a flame that is right next to JFK's grave, which is always supposed to be lit, you see here in this photo. And they really wanted to tie it to the other memorials of other presidents in Washington, D.C. So the eternal flame is on the same line as the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, and then the third thing on the same line is the eternal flame. President William Howard Taft is also buried at Arlington. Yes, I knew there was one other. Final cemetery. Again, these three are representing very different things. The first one, Sleepy Hollow, was this sort of playground for the literary figures. Arlington National Cemetery has this fascinating history of the, the intersection of, of historical figures and is our site for burying veterans. This third one sort of speaks more to the corporate takeover of funerals, the funeral industrial complex, as Greg Melville calls it. This is Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale, which I drive by every single day on the way to work. And I swear to God, I thought it was a country club. And that is the entire point because the, the hills are so beautifully manicured. The trees look a little creepily utopian. And again, that's the whole design. Forest Lawn has 350,000 people buried there, and it is the site for celebs. Walt Disney's buried there, Elizabeth Taylor, Michael Jackson, Carrie Fisher, Nat King Cole, the list goes on. This man named Hubert Eaton in 1917 bought the land, and he envisioned Forest Lawn as just as what it is today. This celebrity haven, this land for the elite to be buried. And he wanted it to be a sort of fun amusement, amusement park-like place. In fact, Disneyland was created in the 1950s and Disneyland modeled its design and its visual elements after Forest Lawn. So Central Park is built upon a cemetery and Disneyland is modeled after one. I just said that, Shanzi. Well, I did say that. Uh, Humphrey Bogart too is buried at Forest Lawn. Shanzi was telling me. The Marx Brothers, wow. <laughs> Betty Davis, who's Betty, da who's Betty Davis? 
Who's Liberace? <laughs> I, they're all staring at me. I'm sorry. I, I don't know who those people are. Sean, you got to listen, though, my dear. I said Walt Disney, didn't I? Tisk tisk, men, men. Anyway, so Disneyland is modeled off of Forest Lawn. Actually, Forest Lawn didn't allow Jews or other minorities in the premises to be buried there until 1959, which is shady, obviously. But Forest Lawn is called Forest Lawn Memorial Park. It's not called a cemetery. Again, that's by design. They don't want you to be thinking about death. Ronald Reagan was married at Forest Lawn, not to Nancy, but to his first wife because there are chapels on the forest lawn premises that allow you to get married there. Again, fits the whole fun amusement park playground vibe. Also, they, uh, the, the, uh, the founder, Hubert Eaton of Forest Lawn, wanted to make it sort of a haven of Christianity and Western civilization. So he has these sort of insanely ostentatious replications of classic, um, Western civilizational pieces of art. For instance, you can see here that is a 17 foot tall statue of David, which is the uh, Greek uh, statue, of course. There's also a 30 foot tall stained glass reproduction of Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. There's a 13 foot tall statue of George Washington, a 200 foot long portrayal of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's actually the world's largest religious painting at, uh, in the world at Forest Lawn, and a three-story tall copy of the Declaration of Independence. Another part of Forest Lawn, they don't have any tombstones that stick up because they want, when you look, they want you to think it's just hills and beautiful like sort of mountains. They don't want you to be reminded that there are dead people there. So all of the tombstones lie flat. Additionally, you would think that they would want to advertise that a lot of celebrities are buried there. But if you go to Forest Lawn, there's a heavy security apparatus and they actually try to not give you any information about where Walt Disney is buried. They want you to kind of figure it out yourself because it adds to the allure of the place. Finally, there is a gift shop on the premises and the, the, the whole enterprise is so successful that the CEO of Forest Lawn, which is a cemetery, gets paid a $1.5 million salary. Maybe we should all go work at Forest Lawn. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. It shows you so much about the practical, symbolic, religious, and financial elements of death. But those are all, indeed, elements of life. I'll see you soon, my friends. And just a reminder to hit the subscribe button if you want to learn about more cool, fun topics, because life is cool. See you soon. Take care. <laughs>